Judges chapter 16, verse number 19. Verse number 19, let's stand up together for the reading of the Word of God. If you love the Bible, say amen. amen. Good to be in the house of God. Good to have the holy, inspired, infallible Word of God. You'll need to keep your Bible open tonight, and uh, we'll be looking at it together. Judges chapter 16, verse number 19. I took a dose of medicine at 6.15 tonight. It'll be kicking in in a few minutes, and I'm not responsible for what is said. It's pretty strong stuff. I think it's called Percocet or something like that. And uh, I've got some, amen? Uh, if, you know, I've, I've got some of that for sale at the book table as well. <laughs> Judges chapter 16, verse number 19. Verse number 19. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she called, caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep, and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. Look at this. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Verse 22, let's read it out loud together. How be it, the hair of his head began to grow after he was shaven. I have a message that I've preached from this chapter of the Bible before. It's entitled, They Forgot to Call the Barber. I mean, they had him down, but they forgot to keep his hair short. And the devil sometimes undoes himself and even defeats himself when he tries to destroy the life of a child of God. But for a few moments tonight, I want to look at the other side of this chapter of the Bible. And I want to look at a message, and I want to look at the verse where the Bible said, He did grind in the prison house. And I want to speak for a little while tonight on the subject of grinding in the prison house. What does that mean for your life and for your heart? If you say amen real good and you help me to preach good, I'll get through the bad part real fast and maybe I'll get on to the barber shop. Amen? If not, I'm going to leave you all miserable before the night is out, condemned, under conviction, and feeling miserable. Which would you rather choose? So, God is good. Amen. Good. All right. Very good. And now let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. And we're going to consider this subject of grinding in the prison house. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Word of God and for all that it means to us. God, how we need to hear from Thee. I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to rest upon this place. God, I just acknowledge total dependence upon You tonight. I pray that You'll help and bless and strengthen Thy Word to all of our lives. And then, God, I pray that for that one here tonight that's lost, the one that's lost and doesn't know it, the other who's lost and who is fighting with you and arguing in his heart about why he does not need to be saved. I pray that tonight would be the end of arguments. Tonight would be the end of the struggle. That men, women, women, boys and girls would finally come to thee. May the Spirit of God rest upon us as our prayer. And may we truly hear from heaven tonight. In this place. Thank you, Father, for all that you're going to do. We'll give you the praise for all that's accomplished. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Our text tonight is the sad account and the sad ending of the lives of one of the better known Bible figures. If you study and talk to people, even out in the world, most people have a vague idea who Samson was. As a kid growing up, before I even knew the Bible, I remember those old films they put out 
those old Italian films where they'd move their mouths and then the words would come out later. You know what I'm talking about? And we'd uh, watch uh, movies like Ghidra and Mothra and Godzilla and all that. And I remember the old films that came out on Samson and Delilah. I think Victor Mature was one of the main men uh, in the movie and some woman that uh, looked like Harlot. And they had them, of course, in, involved in that old story of Samson and Delilah. Even the world, uh, when you say the word Samson, it's a great picture of strength. I have in my home some Samsonite luggage, and of course that is named after the strength of Samson. If you study your Bible, you'll find that Samson was a man that was a judge over the nation of Israel for about 20 years. He began his life as a child all the way back as the son of Manoah, all the way back as a young man from the tribe of Dan. A chronicle of his life would begin in chapter 13, verse number 7. You'll find, first of all, that Samson was a separated man. The Bible said in chapter 13, verse 7, the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. A young Nazarite vow, when a parent dedicated his child uh, to the Nazarite vow, he meant, it meant that he was never to shave his head. Understand that a man with long hair in the Bible, it was a shame for a man to wear long hair. And his vow was a vow of shame and dependence and utter absolute humility to depend upon God. He also had a vow where he was never to touch of the fruit of the vine. He was not to drink wine. He was not to drink grape, grape juice. He was never to touch anything like that, nor was he ever to come to a, uh, to a dead thing or to an unclean thing or to touch a carcass of any kind. Samson was a separated man. Study the Bible, you'll find that Samson was a spiritual man. The Bible said in chapter 13, verse number 25, the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times between the camp, uh, uh, the, the, at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtiol. God began to put his hand upon Samuel's li Samson's life. This was a man not necessarily big and burly and bad to the bone. If you saw him in a crowd, he probably would not have had uh, that giant gold gym figure. He probably didn't have uh, a huge physique uh, with abs and all that. He probably just had one big ab, amen? like most of us in this room, but I mean, he didn't necessarily have a six pack and he didn't have ripped arms and ripped legs uh, like myself. And he probably was not uh, a picture of physique and workout ethic. He might've looked just like any one of us in this room, but he had the power of God upon his life. He had the spirit of God upon his life. He was a separated man. He was a very spiritual man. Chapter 14, verse number six deals with the fact uh, of Samuel, the Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand. Chapter 14, verse 19, again, the Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Over and over again, the testimony of Samson was the fact that he was a, he was a very separated man. He was a very spiritual man, and of course we all know he was a very strong man. The power of God resided clearly and without measure upon the life of this Old Testament judge. In chapter 14, verse 6, he killed a lion. In chapter 15, verse 16, he killed 1,000 men uh, with the jawbone of a donkey. And he was able to go out and take simply uh, a jawbone of an animal and kill 1,000 Philistine men. He was a very, very strong man. There were some problems, though. Samson was not altogether what God wanted him to be. Not only was he separated, not only was he strong, not only was he spiritual, unfortunately, Samson was a very sensual man. Study the Bible. Chapter 14, verse number 1. Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman of the Timna of Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. In verse 2, he came up and told his father and mother, said, I have seen a woman. Now therefore get her for me to wife. Verse number 3, his father and mother said, there, she's not of thy brethren. She's an uncircumcised Philistine. And Samuel, Samson said, get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. In verse number 16, chapter 16, verse number 1, 
Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went in unto her. He was a sensual man. Study Samson's, Samson's life, you'll find Samson's lust. You'll find Samson lying and you'll find Samson's lack. Samson had a lack of discipline. He had a lack of discernment. He was a young man who did not have the ability to see evil when it came to him and eventually and consequently it destroyed his life. He was a sensual man. He was a selfish man. Chapter 14 verse 13 we find all of his companions with him. 30 men at his wedding uh, there, uh, there down in the valley uh, of Sarek. And while he's there, these 30 men, his friends, come to the wedding and he gives them a riddle and lies to them and tricks them so that he can give them more out of them than what he should have. Hey, how many believe that the fact that they came to his wedding, it should have been a blessing? Say amen. But it wasn't enough. He not only wanted their blessing, he wanted their money. And he was a very, very uh, selfish young man. He was also a stubborn young man. He said to his mom and dad, they said, why don't you get somebody else? Why don't you get another young man? Hey, why don't you get someone that's circumcised? But he said in chapter 14, verse 2, she pleaseth me. I like her. She looketh good to me. Verse number 3, she pleaseth me well. And because of that, he pressed on his parents, and he pressed on his mom and dad, and he entered into a marriage relationship that he never should have entered into. As a result of that, he ended up losing his wife, he ended up losing his testimony, he lost his dignity, and now we find Samson again in our text. In chapter number 15 and chapter number 16, we finally find Samson down uh, with a woman of the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. He, we find that Samson was, Samson was sensual. He was selfish. He was stubborn. But eventually, he was stopped. God had finally had enough of Samson's willful ways, and God finally allowed Samson to make such a bad decision that he marries this woman that outwardly looked like a match made in heaven, but inwardly behind the scenes was a manipulative trick from the devil himself. Most of you know the story of Samson and who? Delilah. I don't often meet girls named Delilah in Baptist churches. How you doing? Uh, what's your daughter's name? Delilah. And here's her sister Jezebel. But anyway, I don't hear that very often. Uh, Delilah is not a very common name. If your name is Delilah, don't get mad at me. Don't get upset. Uh, if you are, uh, it doesn't mean a thing. But people who know the Bible don't usually call their child Delilah. And, and understand tonight, uh, we know what that means. Delilah was a harlot. De a Del Delilah was a wicked woman. She was a woman that the Bible makes it very clear uh, was selfish, seething, and sensual to the core. She lived for one person, and that was for her what? For herself. And she had no love, no concern, no care about Samson. She only wanted to get the money that the Philistines offered in order to bring Samson in. Samson had a death warrant on his, on his head. He had a warrant out among the Philistines, and they said, dead or alive, you bring him in, and we'll give you 100 pieces of silver. He had killed the Philistines over and over again. He was judging the people of God. He was causing uh, faith to rise up among God's people, and as a result, the the Philistines attacked him, destroyed him, and eventually put out his eyes. He goes down to this valley of Sarek, and he involves himself with this seething, sensual woman. The Bible said of this woman and others like her in Proverbs 7, verse 26, the strange woman of the Bible, she hath cast down many women. Many strong men have been slain by her. I've seen some big, strong, strapping young men in a church like this. I've seen fellows that were promising, uh, saying amen up on the front row. I've been around guys that had a little bit of ability, had a little bit of talent. I mean, nice looking and all that. And get around them a little bit, and they talk to you about what God is going to do with their life and then you see them a few years later and they don't look so good anymore and they've grown uh, long hair and they're a little scruffy on the outside and say, what happened to your life? And just about every time you write it down, some Delilah came along and ruined their lives. Young men, you better be careful who you hang around with. 
Young men, you better listen to your mom and dad. Say amen. Your mama knows more about women than you do, and your mama can spot uh, a strange woman faster than you can. Young ladies, you better be careful to listen to your dad. Your dad knows more about that man than you do. Somebody say amen. He knows what she's really like, and you better start learning to listen to your parents tonight. One day, Samson wakes up with a stark reality that something is gone out of his life. He used to be able to shake himself. One little shake and men would go flying in all directions. And now as he puts his head down on the lap of one of the most ungodly women the Bible and the world has ever seen, he wakes up now. He's no longer the strong man of the Bible. He's no longer the separated man of the Bible. He's no longer that man of God that we know of as Samson, the mighty man. Now he's just like you. Now he's just like me. He's been shorn. And during the middle of the night, she found out the secret of his heart. And he told him all of his heart. She cut off his hair. Not only was he shorn, he, he was sightless. He woke up and the Philistines grabbed him and they beat him and they put out his eyes. He was sightless. He was shorn. He was absolutely, uh, his strength was gone. And now this man that used to be a judge over Israel finds himself in the middle of Philistines and he shakes himself and he doesn't even know that the power of God has gone off of his life. Listen to me very carefully. Here's the point of the message. You and I, if we're not careful, can lose God's power off of our lives. You and I, the day we get saved, we are saved positionally forever. Do you believe that? Don't make me say, don't make me pull amens out of you. Just say it, amen? I mean, you and I, when we got saved, the Bible makes it very clear. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When you trust Christ as your Savior, you positionally are saved forever. Is that good doctrine? Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. But personally... And practically, the question is, do you have the abiding sense of the power of God upon your life? Do you have the presence and the power of God upon your life to be a soul winner? Do you have the presence of, and the power of God upon your life to live a holy life? Do you have the presence and the power of God upon your life to be a father, to be a good mother, to be a good husband, to be a good wife? I can tell you tonight, just like Samson, you might shake yourself every now and then and try to say the things that sound good or come out with a cliche, but I found out this on the long run. It takes the power of God to make you what you need to be as a Christian. Say amen. amen. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches, abide in me. Zechariah 4, 6, the Bible says, it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And now this man finds himself, he's been beaten, he's been blinded, he's been bruised, he's been broken, and now he's bound to a, an old uh, grit, a mill, and he's hooked onto a grist mill, and now we find him grinding it out in the prison house. I meet people every day. They're just grinding it out in the Christian life. I don't know about you, when I got saved, how many ever heard the song, Joy Unspeakable and Full of Glory? Yeah. Amen? The half has never yet been told. And I can tell you that I don't always walk around with a big smile on my face. It looks like I took two Percocets. I don't look like that all the time. I don't look like I just drank a fifth of liquor. Yippee! Ha, ha, ha. Praise the Lord. I don't look like these charismatics do on the TV show, and neither do they. Say amen. Uh, they only look like that when the camera's on. Somebody say amen. They're just like you and me. But I'm saying this to you tonight. There is such a thing as overall abiding joy unspeakable and full of glory. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you that your joy might be full. And you and I can know the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. The Bible said the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, uh, and, and temperance, and on and on. God has given us wonderful fruit as you and I walk in the power, the anointing, and the blessing of God upon our life. You know how that happens? You stay separated. Somebody say amen. amen. You stay spiritual. It means you stay in your Bible. You walk with God. 
You spend time in prayer. You come to church more than once a month. Somebody say amen to that. You come to church even when it's cold outside. Somebody say amen. I have to say some of the people in this room, you're a great testimony to Cleveland Baptist Church. I've watched every night some of you come in, and I know you've been out at work all day, and I know some of you are a little bit older, and I'm sure some of you have rheumatoid and arthritis and, and corns and bunions and everything else. Some of you have come up to me and said, how's your shoulder? And I want to crawl under a hole somewhere and say, they're asking me how my shoulder is. Come walking up to me with two canes and can barely walk. How's your shoulder, Brother Rossi? Are you okay? I prayed for you today. No, I ought to be praying for you. Say amen. And yet you're here every time the door is open. You're trying to walk with God. Pastor calls for soul winning. You're here when soul winning time comes. You're here when visitation time comes. I go to churches where I, I meet fine young men, fine young families. They're walking with God. Everything's going great. Hey, soul winning Saturday morning. I'm sorry, we have Little League. The coach won't let us uh, miss Little League. Why don't you tell the coach, hey, you're a good fellow, but my pastor wants me in church Saturday morning, and church is more important than soccer. Yeah. And yet, uh, Samson, in small and varying degrees, began to make allowances for himself that God never made. He began to make excuses for himself that God never gave him. And Samson, because of his strength, because of his might, and I guess he must have been a good-looking fellow on top of it all. Have you, you ever meet somebody that has it all? They can sing, they can preach, they can pray, they have money, they got a nice car, they've got everything, they got a beautiful wife, they got nice kids, and they're good looking on top of it all. It's not fair. Say amen. I mean, we all have to have some negative category. Say amen. I know what mine are, a lot of them. Amen. You get into the looks category, boy, that, that's where I got shortchanged. Look at this. I mean, we all have to have some deficit. Man, I, I don't know about you, Pastor. I get around these guys that can do everything. Man, it's bothersome. I say it's not, a, it's not fair. And yet, you wonder, are they really walking in the power of God? I'm glad that God gives us limitations. I'm glad that God gives us those built-in things in our life and quirks and shortcomings where we have to rely upon God. And Samson is a picture of a man who decided I can do it on my own, I can live it on my own, now I can decide who I'll marry. Now I can decide what I'll do with my life. Now I'll decide where I can go. I'll decide that even though I'm a Nazarite, and even though I have a vow of separation upon my life, I can begin to allow small concessions, and it'll be all right. Let me say this to you tonight. It's the little foxes that spoil the vines. Yeah, right. Satan never tempts men all at once. It never happens all in one shot. You don't walk into the office, and the first day a new secretary comes in, she writes you a note, says, you're a real handsome fella, you're a real cute guy, I like you, and I'd like to take you and steal you away from your family. It doesn't happen that way. It happens all in small and varied degrees. Can I get your coffee for you? You like cream in your coffee, don't you? Okay. Mm, my wife doesn't even know that I like coffee. And then, uh, how do you like, I brought you a sandwich today. I put mayonnaise on there just like you like it. Mm, my wife always puts mustard on mine. And, and in small and varying degrees, you begin to make a little connection. You get to talk a little bit at the break room. You get to fellowship a little bit at the lunch hour. And then in small and varying degrees, there's a little emotional attachment. You say, how do you know this? I've sat across the desk from broken-hearted people and broken marriages, and I don't even have to ask them. I tell them how it happens because it happens every single time. Say amen. amen. Ladies, none of you will go, get, get, just rush out and get involved with some man just like that. Instead, it's a little bit at a time. You look nice today. Really? You sure do. I like that nail polish. Mm, my husband doesn't even know I wear nail polish. Your, your hair looks really nice. My husband said it looks like a rat's nest. And I noticed you've lost a few pounds. I've been on Jenny Craig for three years, and he hadn't even noticed. Do you know what I'm talking about? And little by little, people begin to fall into sin. Little by little, they begin to watch things that they never would have watched before on the television set. Amen. Somebody say amen. If you took what's on tonight 
and just flipped it back 30 years without warning and you were sitting in your room 30 years ago and your mom and dad were sitting there with you and suddenly tonight's program of murder and CSI and all this ungodly stuff and profanity and nudity and everything else that people are addicted to, if you just simply flipped it back without warning, even the game shows with scantily attired women who have the attire of a harlot on, if you just flipped it back without warning, Mom and dad would have got a shotgun off the top mantelpiece. They'd have blown the front right out of the TV. Said, look out, kids. Old Bessie's about to roar. And, and they'd have blown the front right out of the TV set. But little by little, by little, we've allowed things into our life and home that a prior generation never would have allowed. Used to be preachers would get up and preach about everything. They'd preach against cigarettes. They preach against beer. They preach against long hair. They preach against wearing glasses. They preach against carrying a cane. They preach against chewing gum. They preach against mini skirts. They preach against everything under the sun. And people used to hit the altar in large numbers and get right with God and get right with one another. And the more they preached, the more separated we got. And the more separated we got, the more soul winning power we got. And the power of God came on our churches. And thousands of people got saved in the 60s and early 70s because God had something he could use. He was looking for a vessel to pour out a spirit upon, a separated vessel, a spiritual vessel, and a strong vessel that God could use. But little by little, sensualities crept, crept in. Little by little, selfishness has crept in. Little by little, self-will and stubbornness have crept into churches. I preach in churches, and you, you get, get to preaching hard, you can see them. I look back, and I see men and women. I see women looking at their husbands. I don't like this guy. And I've heard them out in the foyer. I didn't like that preaching at all. Let's get out of here. I've heard them. And I've heard the men, yes, dear, I'm coming. And little Melvin Milk tells. Uh, I mean, I've seen men start getting stirred up. Hey, man. And see his wife nudge him. Shut up. Don't say amen to that preaching. I don't like it. Hey, brother, you shouldn't have to get a permission slip every time you say amen. amen. Come on now. And ladies, you ought to get excited about the fact that some good old-fashioned preaching goes on at this church every week. I know the kind of preaching that goes on here. And instead of getting mad every time it affects the way you live, maybe we ought to get right with God and right with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. Somebody say amen. amen. He said, well, I like my deer hunting, and I like my fishing, and I like what I do, and I like uh, being, having a good time. So do we all. The devil likes all that stuff, and the flesh likes all that, and the flesh wants to be on vacation, but there's a world that's dying and going to hell, and somebody needs to do that's something right. about it. That's, right. that's why we need to have an old-fashioned revival. Amen. Amen. The most important thing in Cleveland, Ohio tonight, that's right. That's right. it's going on in this church. Yes, right. Amen? Amen? It's going on right here. The most important thing in Cleveland, Ohio will go on Saturday morning. When people, is that your visitation time? Thursday night, I guess, or Tuesday night, whatever. Whatever nights your visitation and soul winning times are, those are the most important things going on in Cleveland, Ohio. And you and I ought to make that a part of our life. And this young man who decided he knew more than God and more than his parents finally woke up and he realized suddenly... He's sightless. He can't see anymore. The devil will steal your eyes. I've seen people that come to church and used to walk with God, and we've gone out visiting and go with pastors to see him. Say, hey, preacher, there's a young man used to come to church, and let's go see him. Let's go visit him in the hospital or visit him at his house. And I've knocked on their door. I don't believe that way anymore, preacher. I don't believe like you do. You know what's happened? They've had their eyeballs poked out by the Philistines. Say amen right there had their hair cut off, stripped, shorn. But I'll ask them, how's your life? Are you happy? And always, they'll look toward the floor. And always, they'll say, no, I'm not happy. Because you know what they're doing? They're grinding it out in the prison house. You'll never get happy until you and I get right with God and get into the center of His perfect will. You'll never have joy until you're doing the thing that God wants you to do with the attitude that God wants you to maintain, with a broken heart, with a desire to serve Him. The only joy that ever comes is found in serving Jesus. Do I have an amen to that? My wife and I have tried it all. 
I mean, we've tried just as much as we could as far as being in the ministry. And we've been told, you need to do this, and you need to do that. And Brother Ross, you need to have this hobby and that hobby. You know what I found out? Hobbies for me are nothing more than a distraction. Say amen. I've had old cars and fancy stuff and tried to fix them all up. Well, I need to have a good hobby here. And all a hobby does for me is destroys my spiritual life. I ought to be focused on heaven. Say amen. I ought to be focused on Christ and the Bible, the Word of God, and focused on lost people dying and on their way to a lake of fire. That'll make you happy. Say amen. amen. And it seems like the happiest days of our life have just been driving up the road in our truck, trailer behind us, out in the middle of nowhere, just serving God. And hundreds of times we've looked at each other and said, you know, this is what we belong doing. This is what God has for us. This is God's plan for our life. And everything else is just grinding it out in the prison house. You can have money and you can still be a grinder. Amen. You can have lots of friends. <laughs> I'm the spiritual butterfly of the church, and I, I float around from house to house. Hello, hello. And I go from fellowship to fellowship. God bless you, you can have all the friends in the world. And you can still be a grinder because deep down inside, you're miserable. You're insecure. You're fearful. You're afraid. You can have power. You can have prestige. You can be able to throw people around. I'll never forget the day when I walked into a man's office. He had a multi-million dollar company. He, I walked into his office. I walked right by his beautiful brand new Mercedes Benz. Walked by on the other side his beautiful Cadillac that he drove to work in. And when I walked into his office and sat down, tears running down his cheeks, he said to me, I am miserable. I have things. I have money. I have possessions. But I'm a miserable man. What do I need? And I told him, you need God in your life. You need to have Christ as your Savior. And he got saved by the grace of God. And until that day, he was just grinding it out in the prison house. Samson is one of the sad stories of the Bible. But in verse number 28, we find a remarkable verse of Scripture. Let's look back at verse number 22 first. How be it, what? How be it, what? The hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. You know what I find out? Even though we make bad choices, listen, even though we make bad choices in life, and I'd like to ask you this, how many of you have lived long enough to make at least one pretty bad choice? Amen. How many of you made several? How many of you could wave both arms at me if I asked you? All right, good. I'm a little warm up here. Let's get it going. Get some air moving. And you could. Matter of fact, I meet people say, Brother Ross, that's all I ever do is make bad choices. Amen? Everything I do is the wrong thing. And yet, you know what I found out? I found out in spite of it all, as bad as this is, we have a God who is a God of second chances. We have a God who's a God of third chances. We have a God who's a God of fourth and fifth and sixth chances. He gives you other, he gives you chances again, and he gives other people chances again. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul just said it like this: He's the God of all grace. And the Bible said that God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency, may abound unto every good work. God has made it very clear that no matter how bad it is for you tonight, no matter how far you've gone, no matter how long you've been hooked onto the grindstone it is time for you as a child of God to realize God wants your hair to grow back and God wants you to give you a second chance Samson he was broken he was beaten he was blinded and bruised but thank God in verse 22 he was he was back God wasn't done with Samson God wasn't through with his life God had one more thing that he wanted Samson to do. I was out in California last year in a church, and they're into this 24. And uh, they, they, uh, they had this 24 clubs and everything in the church. And one of the men had a T-shirt on. It said, Jack is back. And I, I said, what's that mean? He said, Jack Bauer, man. Don't you know what Jack Bauer is? And I didn't know at the time what it was all about. And they told me all about it. I stayed in a real beautiful cottage they had. And had all these 24 CDs there and everything. So I found out what 24 was. And they said, Jack is back. I don't know about Jack being back. But I can say this to you tonight. No matter how far you've gone, God wants you back. God wants your life back. 
God wants your spirit back. God wants your joy back. God wants your focus and your, uh, your faith back to the place where God wants you to be fruitful and used of the Lord to be a blessing to other people. I preached the other night about the coming tsunami. Folks, I believe that judgment has come to America. I believe with all of my heart that America is in dire trouble tonight. And this man, Samson, had a personal tsunami when all of his sin caught up to him and all of his selfishness caught up to him and all of his self-will and stubbornness and pride caught up. But God wasn't done, and God allowed his hair to grow back on his head again. And now the Bible says, let me finish up here in just a moment. We might get out early tonight. Then again, we might not. <laughs> Depends on how well that medicine kicks in. Starting to feel good. <laughs> but when God shut him down, the Bible says now that his hair begins to come. And I won't belabor this point, but did you notice before God allowed him to be hooked on the grindstone, even in the midst of it all, Samson tried to rely on the same thing he'd always use. He tried his little dance, and this time it didn't work. I believe there's a day coming where your personality is not going to be enough. I believe there's going to be a day coming when slick methodology is not going to be enough. I believe there's a day coming to America when everyone is going to be tried. I believe many of you in this room are going to fall under great persecution. You say, what about the rapture of the church? I believe in the rapture. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. But God never said that you and I won't have to endure some persecution. We won't have to go through the great tribulation. Say amen. amen. Did you know that tonight, as we speak, there's a company called Very Chip International. Very Chip International is a company that develops implants and uh, implant uh, microchips that go under your right hand. They said that the right hand is the best place because of the heat transfer there allows the batteries to last longer. So they are putting chips into people's right hands and they're beginning to put them into people's foreheads for the very same reason. Did you know that Very Chip International is negotiating with the United States government right now in order to try to replace the dog tag system? in the military and then eventually they want to put a chip into every man's hand and into every man's forehead. They want them to have two in the event that they get uh, dismembered, their arm is lost, they can still retrieve all their information. That is happening right now. And do you know tonight there are people and organizations that want very much to pass laws and ordinances that say that every newborn baby has to be chipped. Every newborn baby has to be microchipped. Now here's the question. What are you going to do, young people, when the letter comes in your mailbox It says that your baby that's born after a certain day must have a microchip? Your baby must have an implant. Are we going to stand in the Bible that says that that is the image, the mark of the beast? Or are we going to say, well, that's just technology and it'll be a better way to live? I'm saying you and I are going to be facing issues that the world around us has never faced before. And we think it was tough when we had to go to war, and go to battle, just to have Christian schools. We thought it was a tough thing when men like Brother Roloff had to go to court in order to have a boy's home. Some of that stuff, I believe, is going to be a Sunday school picnic compared to some of the issues you and I will face as God's people over the next few years. I'm not going to talk about the upcoming election, but you might as well just figure out who I don't want to get in. Amen. And her first name is Mrs. Say amen right there. Thank you. And I'm telling you tonight, it is time for God's people to get serious about serving God. We've already had eight years of bill. God help us. We don't need any more of that. Say amen. Already had Jezebel and Ahab in the White House one time. And I'm saying to you tonight that it's time for God's people to realize in a place like this, that we must have the power of God. We must have God's full blessing upon our life. We must be not only good, sweet, uh, uh, sh uh, sharp little Christians that look right and sound right and dress right. We need to be armed and dangerous spiritually and walk out of a church like this, not only saved but filled with the Holy Spirit and go out with soul winning power and a great burden to do business for God and win lost people that you and I as God's people might take out some of the Philistines and be 
those men and women that God wants us to be. And the Bible said in verse number 28, I'll close here very shortly. Verse number 28. They brought him into the house of Dagon. They were going to mock Samson and make fun of him. They were going to tease and ridicule. Can you imagine all those false idol worshipers? They said, hey, we know what to do. Bring in Samson. Let's make fun of him. And they brought him in, but they didn't realize old Samson hair, his hair had grown back. And they set him between the pillars. And he said to a lad in verse number 26, Suffer that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. I heard a message years ago on feeling the pillars. He said, let me feel those pillars one more time. He puts a hand on each. Samson, in verse number 28, he called unto the Lord. I want to say to you tonight, number one, when you and I get shut down and when you and I are grinding out, number one, the first thing you and I need to do is learn how to call unto God. It is time for the church to begin calling upon God once again. It is time for the church to be learning to say with David, I cried unto the Lord and he heard me and he heard my cry. Forty times in the Bible, you'll find that phrase, I cried unto the Lord. I cried unto the Lord. I cried unto the Lord. And God wants you and I to call upon God. Do I have an amen? amen. Our answer is not in the White House. It's not in the legislative branch. It's not in the House of Commons. It's not in the judiciary side. The only answer for America is down at the house of God. It's down in church when you and I as God's people get desperate and broken and begin calling upon God one more time. And he called upon the Lord, and here was his prayer. He said, God, in verse number 28, remember me, I pray. And then he said, strengthen me. I pray this once. When's the last time you got on your knees and said, God, remember me? How many in this room tonight, honestly, how many are in a trial right now? Could I see your hand? You're in a trial right now. If you're not in a trial, you've probably just come out of a trial. How many would say, I've come out of a trial recently? Could I see your hands? And if you have just come out of a trial, or you're not in a trial, guess what? You're going to be in one very soon, because that's how we all live. And understand tonight, when the first thing that happens when trouble comes, we ought to learn what it means to cry unto God and say, God, remember me. There's a trial in my life. There's trouble that's just come. And God, no matter what it is, I'm begging you. I'm asking you. I'm, I'm, I'm interceding to you. God, I'm making my supplication. God, would you remember me? And then he said, God, strengthen me. We want God to remove us from the trial. When in reality, instead of saying, God, remove me, why don't we say, God, strengthen me? Amen? Amen? Because God may just have some reason that he wants to show himself strong while you're right in the middle of that hard trial in your life. Kids, some of you are going to Bible school next year. Some of you have already been there, and you're going to go back next semester. And the next time financial trouble comes, instead of calling mom and dad, Mom and dad, I'm in trouble again. Why don't you get on your knees, God? Remember me and touch mom and dad's heart to send me some money. God, remember me. God, strengthen me. And don't you know tonight there are other resources other than the ones you see around you? There's a far greater resource, and that's the one who's above you. Say amen. And he calls on God, and he begins to seek the Lord. And you know the account. As he pushed on those pillars, he killed more Philistines in his death than all the Philistines which he had done in verse 30 in his life. And when God allowed Samson finally to get back to the place where he'd look to God. You know what he did? Samson got his focus back. Samson got his fervency back. Samson got his fight back. And as a result of that, Samson got his fruit back. He got the power of God restored to his life. That's all I can preach tonight. 
But I want to say that it's time for some of the blind to start seeing again. When's the last time you read your Bible and you walked out of that room saying, I've seen Jesus in all of his glory? You know, I didn't have to go to the Passion of the Christ. I didn't have to go to a movie house to see the Lord. I've seen him many times in his word. I've seen him throughout the pages of Scripture. And understand tonight, when you get right with God, you don't have to be entertained, and you don't have to be stroked, and you don't have to be charged up and pep rallied up. You have God at work in your life, and you begin to see him who is invisible. The blind get their sight back. The weak get their strong, their strength back. And tonight, by the grace of God, never lose your separation and never lose your submissive, seeking heart for the glory of God. I'd like for us to bow our heads, please, and our hearts together for prayer.